So the idealistic approach where we just do nothing is capitalism. Everybody's seeking their own self-interest and it'll all just sort of work itself out. Communism doesn't eliminate trade. It just changes it to where there's no longer money. In order to achieve communism, you have to get rid of money. Is it not fair to hold communists responsible for the means and methods by which it would come about, even if those means and methods are distinct from what it will be in the end? Are they good? Are they bad? Is it worth it? Well, I mean, it's just a historical process. Same yes, way that but some processes are different. Some processes are better than others. Like electing the Democrats is not going to get anyone anywhere. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but like an actual legitimate paradise. revolutionary workers government elected by the people and accountable by the people. The transition towards a dictatorship of the okay. proletariat and then socialism down the road uh, at some unspecified future, uh, future. We really don't even know if it works in theory. But we suspect that it should. In the, uh, you know, hypothetical universe that doesn't f exist. Is Count Haas. Jesus Christ. We're gonna, we're gonna. It's capitalism versus communism. An oldie but a goodie, gang. And we're just gonna get straight into it. F introductions, f opening statements. Let's go, gang. Capitalism is good. Changed my mind. Well, if capitalism was as good as you are saying it is, we wouldn't have so much poverty across the entirety of the world. So okay. I think we can acknowledge that, you know, no system is probably going to be able to eliminate all ills. If you want to talk about global poverty in particular, I mean, capitalism has been great at eliminating that over the last like half century. Uh, let's talk about how it uh, manifests today. Why are the for those of you who are consider yourselves communists or socialists, right? Why do you think that is a better system than what we have now? Please convince us. The system we have now, a study of the U.S. Census data shows 17 million empty homes in the United States, a country with about 600,000 homeless people. It's a ratio of 28 to 1. The efficiency in supposed free market isn't paying workers enough to afford these homes as capitalists invest their money in speculate and gamble in the stock market while real resources like food and shelter and medicine are being hoarded and deliberately kept from the working class Americans. You can ask any average working class worker, American, and be like, hey, look, there's 28 empty houses for every one homeless family. Does that make sense to you? Now, surely there's yes. got to be a better way to organize this system. But instead, the vast majority of private property, including empty houses, is owned by massive corporations and banks and they're only being done so to speculate on to create more capital and more like it, it, it's, it's it's silly the you, any of you who live in large cities will see the ever-growing uh tent cities of homeless people and yet like there's millions of houses that sit empty this is an incredibly inefficient nonsensical system uh usda is 34 million americans uh, including 9 million children are food insecure, right? And that was even this, the, that stat comes before the inflation. How does communism solve this? By rational planning and redistribution and democratic ownership over the means of production. What do you, what, what do the rest of you think about that? The capitalists, do you think that that's a, a reasonable solution? Um, no, um, look, we can go down to specifics. Like for example, the way in which you characterize the vacant homes to homeless people is incredibly misleading because the reality is those vacant homes aren't in the areas where homeless people are or incredibly dilapidated and borderline condemned. The reality is there isn't a shortage of housing anywhere where there are, where there is a real um, intensity of the homelessness problem. In fact, one of the biggest problems we have in America, unfortunately, is our inability to build houses. If we could build houses for these people it would be real but we can't america is a really big country so you can't just use a national stat for that kind of housing um and when it comes to <clears throat> problems like deliberately keeping um uh food from working americans or 34 a million americans are food insecure look there's a lot of problems in the united states of america we can work to improve them but i really don't think that these sort of comical depictions of america at all resemble reality the reality is that the world is a really fucked up place and that there's no system uh communism or capitalism that's going to completely eliminate these things. So we need to take a rational, evidence-based approach as to what are the best ways to minimize and try and improve people's lives. And if you look at the actual evidence over the last 100 years or so, it's just undeniable that globally, in America, no matter where you look in the world, capitalism is doing a really, really is good job. Undeniable? Not a perfect job. Is that undeniable? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. What do, what do the communists think? Is that undeniable? Well, that's just a very well, funny thing. Oh. Well, to directly counter that point, and give up a specific give a specific example in 
LA alone, there's 93,000 available houses, and there are 36,000 unhoused residents. So there are plenty of fucking houses available in LA specifically that they could, sure, could you like that give a free house. Yes. Thank yes, you. I can. But they could quite literally give a house to every single individual that is homeless. I, uh, can can I just source. make two points while he looks for the source? Quick. Uh, I, I So rationally planning a solution, I think that's something what you what you just said. That's literally what like oh. socialism is trying to do. Like we're rationally. So the idealistic approach where we just do nothing is capitalism. It's like, well, let's just leave this all up to like the natural laws of supply and demand and everybody's seeking their own rational self-interest and it'll all just sort of work itself out. Invisible hand, yada, yada, yada. Rationally trying to solve the problem by implementing different economic reforms and stuff like that. That's literally the whole idea of socialism. Yeah, um, I made a point that we should be using evidence-based approach to try and determine what the best system is. That's fundamentally distinct from a rational, central-based economy. And I don't want to speak for all the capitalists here. I don't know if Lactoid's is going to have a problem with this. I'm sorry. I'm please. super big fan of using how, government intervention. How, or how they, some, how I'm, I'm not like a total ANCAP. Um, so, so, for example, you could imagine a scenario in which, different? through rationally analyzing evidence, you realize that not centrally planning is the best thing. And then you would that, not rationally central plan. Hold on. How is rationally using evidence... And, and planning two totally distinct no, things. No, it's not planning. When you talk about uh, central planning of the economy, that doesn't refer to making A, any plan at all. That refers to specifically creating policy that's going to control goods, services, and markets. How that is, is policy distinct. not planning? Because you're talking about a specific kind of policy, not all policy. You're not saying, let's do policy. You're saying, let's do this kind of policy. Come on, now, let's not waste all our time. It's on also one. policy and built policy, on different foundations. What policy with your evidence-based approach would you implement that doesn't, isn't somehow similar to uh, economic planning of some kind? Is it somehow similar to economic planning of some kind? That's a pretty broad definition of communism. I didn't realize we were living so, under it right now in America. Just explain to me the difference. You think there's this huge distinction, and I <laughs> feel like you're stalling because there is none. I'm not stalling. I'm responding to all your points. We're having it back and forth. So, yeah, the so reason we'll why it's the different. Okay. The reason why it's different is because you're advocating a specific economic plan to take control of the economy and direct it in specific ways. Whereas if you were just at, um, uh, I forget the adjective, but in a vacuum, evaluating the evidence based on economic systems, you could come to a different conclusion about a different kind of policy. Just because you are taking a plan to have some kind of policy does not mean it's the same as having a centrally planned economy. So no, I, I definitely agree there's a distinction between those two things. I guess okay. what, you know, and this is part of the issue with debating such a broad topic is like if you're going full on balls deep, like I'm going to defend capitalism, it's the best system possible. Uh, I feel like you're sort of also marrying yourself to the idea that any kind of government interference with that will uh, limit the amount of wealth that we can produce. I mean, that's sort of like, you know, one of the. I don't know, the foundational ideas of like Adam Smith, for example. It's like any kind of government planning will stop the expansion of markets, which are what create wealth. So I'm just curious, like to you, do you think, okay, you're willing to tolerate a little bit of government interference so long as it what preserves like the integrity of the free market? Is that what you would say? No, I don't want to speak for all the capitalists, but personally, I'm a harm reduction guy. I don't really care about the morality, moralization of economic systems. I just think this is the best economic system for uh, having an economy. That's all. That, that, okay, so, you, you know. so you're willing to let 9 million children starve different. because you think it's the best system we have? What a non sequitur. Um, so, so maybe to, yeah. Um, so is, is there like government invention, intervention that can be like capitalist? So it's like if we... I, I feel I feel like I want to clarify yes. this point a little first bit. All, so first so, of all, so let's just yes, yeah. there is government intervention. You can have government intervention and capitalism. They're not mutually exclusive. So if we so if we lower the tax rate dead with each other. I, yeah. so, so if we lower the tax rate, the corporate tax rate by two percent in one year, that's policy. Is that socialism? No. Just sure. If we if we raise it two percent or we lower it two percent, like one of these is capitalism, one of them is socialism. It, it feels like there needs to be a little bit more of a distinction, right? The government doing things isn't socialism. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. So, so, so if we have some kind of government policy that looks at a plan for the future, looks at things rationally, that's not like suddenly now we're socialist. That's something we can 
do under capitalism. So let's take a look at an example. So China is putting um, a lot of effort right now into um, mobilizing uh, small businesses, S SM, SMEMS, small, micro, medium-sized businesses, um, because these are like a big driver of the economy. So they're actually trying to boost their kind of like capitalist free market. And they're doing this with some amount of government intervention, but they're doing it toward this kind of like capitalist free market end. China's maybe a great example to look at because, um, so you're talking about poverty, homelessness. So China's poverty rate in like, I think 1990 or early nineties was like 98%. And now it's about 15% um, after about 30 years of uh, heavy capital. I can, I can what link do you mean that to you, comrade Deng. I can, I can link that into the chat. How, do you, how are you defining cool. poverty? Um, under uh, 550. The World a, Bank um, defines poverty as a dollar something a day. And oh, this is this is much higher. This is like uh, 550. Well, the UN defines uh, bare minimum for for any sort of basic necessities met around the world. The bare minimum is uh, is uh, roughly ten dollars a day, and about four Wait. billion people live okay. below that. Wait, so you just said so you said it was a dollar. And then yeah, I said, oh, this is a much higher standard of 550. And now you said, oh, actually, we should use a $10 mark. I didn't say that. Oh. I said, uh, I said the, the, the World Bank says a dollar something. And okay. the UN says, oh, actually, okay. no, the minimum threshold is actually about $10 a day, which okay. approximately 4 billion people live on. So we, so we split the difference. We get the metric we use. We can quibble World over Bank, those exact numbers. Well, no, my point is the World we can Bank see constantly lowers difference. the threshold. So it looks like more people are being lifted out of poverty. Those numbers are just completely fake. So wait, 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 wait. wait. Are the numbers fake? Or do you think that it this is like getting not redefined the... so that it looks like there's less people on okay. uh, like living what, under what the What number world. would you say is like the, the correct number to look at or or some some curve over time, right? So in the nineties, what number would you use? Uh I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Okay. And in, in and right now, what number would you use? I mean, personally, at least in America, I would say anything under thirty thousand dollars a year is poverty. So, okay, so um, as capitalists, we have to, we're, we're kind of looking a little more broadly. We care about not just poverty here, but poverty across the world. So we have this kind of global perspective. That's something that's critical about the capitalist ideology is that we, we care about not just, you know, homelessness here, but homelessness over there, right? How, how so, socialist of you? Um, I mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, if, you, if you want to call capitalism socialism, gang, gang, we'll, gang, we'll real take quick, it. Real quick, real the, quick. The numbers, right? Um, People quibbling over the numbers we could fight over the numbers well i think we should have a gdp of like that's fine I, let's let's stick to concepts um you can sure. use numbers to, to but, but so, let's the, not get so the so the big point right so okay. the, so the big point was that um with a um rapid um capital capitalization of china going from the 90s to now they went from a very very high poverty rate to much lower exactly what those numbers are we can talk about. Um, but if you're looking at like, okay, we have like some buildings, maybe we can put people in some buildings. I'm all for that, right? And I don't think that these like multinational uh, companies that have a lot of these kind of like shady treaties that are happening that are not kind of like freely viewable, I don't think these are great things. So I have lots of things I can agree about these like multinational corporations, right? But this is kind of a myopic view of how to actually generate wealth that gets people from you know, what the lifestyle was like 200 years ago, where people were dying at, I don't know, 30, 40, uh, terrible teeth, uh, no flat screen TVs to right now, people are living way longer. Um, and we have flat screen TVs, right? A little silly, but um, this is something when we actually try to Dumb. accelerate economic growth. Uh, you know, we're not just quibbling, how can we get a few people in houses, but how can we raise everybody out of poverty? And that's this is what's happening right now in India. That's, the, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it is the wealth is already being generated. It's just being generated by the labor power of the working class. It's Hell just yeah, the, and it's being harnessed efficiently by their capitalist overlords. No, it ain't. Definitely not being harnessed efficiently. Can you, you can assert that, but second. you need to I'll, I'll demonstrate give it. Toy to, uh, 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 space here. Yeah, I'll be I'll, I'll be quiet. honest. I got a little bit uh, confused. We started off going right into like the Hall of Madur. And uh, the history, and I, it's, I, I'll have to break out those books in a second. No, bring but, it, bring it back to what you want. You have the, yeah, you have the floor here, Lactoid. Go abso ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I want to start um, with I, I think asking a fundamental question that that I see as one of the major distinguishing factors between communism and and capitalism. Um, 
I also want to quickly agree somewhat with what non-smoker just said, which is that I think capitalism is not really a system. It's more of a lack of a system, right? Capitalism is merely, we step back and the, all the individual consensual actions that occur, we want to safeguard those, but generally, you know, that that's what it is, right? We're not like aiming for anything particular, whereas capitalism is merely an amalgamation of all the consensual actions that occur within a market every day. Um, my question to the more communist minded people is this. Do you think that merely by virtue of existing, somebody is entitled to the labor of somebody else? To Sorry, say that again. Somebody else? Do you no. think some simply by existing, is this person entitled to the labor of somebody else? To the labor uh, of somebody else? No, but to okay. the value of their own labor, yes. And that's the problem with capitalism is that within capitalism, the people at the top get the value of other people's labor and aren't getting the value of their own labor in the slightest because the value of their own labor would be significantly, significantly lower, if anything. What I'm asking is, are, is somebody just simply by existing, are they entitled to? I'm not saying Nobody's that... entitled to anything just by existing, no. Excellent. No. All right, thank you. So if I go out and build a chair, uh, that's, you know, that's my chair. I can do what I want with it because I've taken part of my life and I've mixed that in with a chair. And if nobody else has a right to that chair, right? If you built the chair, you're saying, yeah. If I go out and build a chair, sure. and if I it's trade that, chair. and if I trade that chair for a goat, then I have the right to that goat, and the other person has the right to the chair, right? This isn't gonna be another dog channel. Don't, don't no, 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 no. It's got nothing to do with that. But like, let's say I trade the chair for the goat, Dude, right? Yes, just make your fucking point. Oh, well, we're we're walking through this. So really, the ultimate point here is that, um, I mean, I you, you've already bit the bullet, I think, a little bit, um. I'm entitled to what I make, and I'm also entitled to what I deal for. If I make an agreement with a corporation to go and work for them for $12 an hour, that's the goat in exchange for the chair, and the chair is what I'm making in the labor force. Uh, it seems like you guys would be advocating for the state to come in and not let me you're, sell you're my chair. Okay, the other guys oh, oh. Are saying. So being entitled to someone else's labor but simply by virtue of existing, for a second there, I thought you were talking about landlords, but what you're actually talking about is, uh, what you're getting at is supposedly the voluntary exchange of labor power, which is the commodity that the working class sells to their boss uh, in exchange for wages. And then they have to it's pay- what any individual does. That, that's, what they, that's what they have to, and they have to pay half their wages to a landlord who does nothing. Um, no, yeah, so- um, Well, they don't do nothing. They provide so here, access here's, to here's their my, house. Here, here's, they don't do the labor. Well, so they, 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 well, they, the con they consensually acquired the labor, right? They consensually acquired the house in the same way that I consensually acquired the goat. And so now if you want to use my goat, you got to pay me 12 bucks an hour for whatever goat purposes you have. Right now. Uh, <laughs> what if, oh my God. <laughs> you know, um, you can't work yeah, without a house, right? In. Yeah, go ahead. You can. What are you talking about? All right. Look, look. No, up. you can't. So the itself. way that th I think this is maybe the disconnect here. So the way that Marxists typically look at this, you're familiar with the labor theory of value, right? Yeah, I, I yes, believe. John Locke, okay, so I you're, love him. You're, I'm pretty sure you kind of know where we're gonna go with this, but just to outline it for everybody else, basically the idea here is that labor power itself is sort of like a commodity, right? So on average, it's exchanged at its value, which is determined by the value of the quantity of the goods required for its reproduction. So what ends up happening is that labor ends up equaling roughly on average close to the means of sustenance, which is what's required to reproduce the labor. So the laborer will go, they'll sell their labor, they'll work, and they'll get paid just enough Wait, to be able to feed themselves. Wait, you're shaking your head. Is he wrong? Absolutely. Your labor is well, worth yeah, what other people why value. Why don't you just want to, can I just like finish the soliloquy? Because I was, I was whole... letting you finish. For some yeah, time. well, I wasn't because in. God. Gang, we need to, we need to speed it up concisely. Uh, you know, means of making money, but could you at least let me finish a sentence too? Since you're what's the so value? Gracious. Wait, what's the value on that? Sorry, isn't the value on your streaming market determined, or is there some kind of intrinsic labor value? Dude, no, this is like totally nonsense. If people just decide to randomly give me money for something that has no value, that's on them, like they're just being nice. No, them that's giving you, them obvious. giving you money for it is a market, right? When you give me money for a chair for a goat, that is the market determining that, like. 
the going rate for a goat is a chair. Yeah, but the, okay. a chair but has no inherent there, value. There's no way to like quantify the value it. of the labor that a streamer does because there's no way to quantify the value of it. It's like some totally abstract thing with no like Wait. no real principle of meaning. Like if someone it's just decides to like, 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 go for it, you know? the value is what the market decides. Yo, no, 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 no. Okay. real quick, real quick, real quick. Like we have so many metrics to determine the value of what we're doing as streamers we have analytics so we have we can i can look at and measure to the second can i just tell you how why it's stupid? people like, are valuing my stream Rick, can i just right? tell you why it's stupid because you're gonna stream like so let's say some random chatter drops a thousand dollars right after you just streamed for two hours do does something. that mean that the stream two hours worth of streaming is worth a thousand dollars no yes what that, absolutely no, 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 but what yes. it means what it means is is really nothing what it means is someone arbitrarily gave you a thousand dollars you would stream two hours three hours four hours five hours regardless of whether or not someone dropped you the thousand dollars because you just like streaming i would assume and now the, i, the I market mean i value know it as a career but for me i'm just speaking the, for myself i go on here and stream regardless of whether or not anyone uh -huh. gives me money it's right right but not, the mark but the market value of your yeah, time a donation the market value of your time is dictated by what, you, more, what by, by, by what food. by what you can I command the sir the yeah i have a doctorate what are you like are you trying to like oh shit he's got a master's degree are you trying to throw, throw, to throw dicks do, anywhere? Yeah, like yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, the market value of my time is way more than when i get there in streaming it's not sure, very close sure yeah the value of you streaming is is not as much as what you're doing other things not while you're there's no value it's just for fun so the market value of you doing something is not a lot okay What's your point? I you you're the one who needed to bring up the whole streaming thing uh, to try to like as some kind of own when I was just like making a so, subtle joke. Yeah, yeah. Get so so you, you threw off the whole fucking conversation. Okay, you answered. If you did, I, you answered that your market the market value for your time streaming is worth nothing. Now uh, that could be true, right? It could be that there's very little financial interest that anybody has to view you. But that's not the case with all personalities. It's not, it's not the case with every person who's on media. That's not the case. You know, there's plenty yeah, of people who, who can, no, there's plenty of people who can command money and value um, based on what they do. So what's the value of, you know, a 30 minute, you know, TV show from Conan O'Brien, right? There is a value there simply because of the value that he brings as a person. Um, and that value is determined by the market, right? The, by the people who are subscribing to that service. If, if nobody wants to buy a chair for me for a goat, that means the chair is not worth a goat because I can't get a goat for the chair in the same way. But if I can trade one chair for 30 goats, then that chair is worth 30 goats because I can get 30. I can get consensually get people like 30 people to give me their goat in exchange for a chair. The basis of market economics is consensual interactions between people. And the basis for communism is intervening in that consensual interaction to have the state dictate what your time is worth when it, it, the market doesn't work that way. Can we use another example than goats? Sure, right? dogs. Like this harem of goats that you are acquiring. It's just it. Okay. Anyway, I hope no one knew on. what you did to the goat. Yeah. So anyway, um, what I was trying to get at with the whole labor power as a commodity, the whole idea I'm trying to get across to you, and I feel like it's really getting lost in a lot of the fucking sidetrack shit about streamers and Conan O'Brien. Like only in the fucking only in the United States or the first world are people like whatever. Anyway, look, um, my point is that people who are doing labor on average tend to be paid roughly equal what it costs to reproduce their labor on average. Sometimes they're paid a little more. Sometimes they're paid a little less. What does That's that just mean? How it ends up happening. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about labor, it's kind of like obfuscated for us in the first world because we actually don't do necessarily a lot of the labor to make most of the stuff that we use. Now, there is labor that goes on in the first world, of course. It's usually to facilitate the shipment of products or, you know, run like different, um, different like aspects of our, you know, modern society, power plants and stuff like that and shipping goods, various things. But uh, it's kind of lost on us sometimes, I think, that we pay these people in the third world very little probably enough so that they can eat, you know, like a couple bowls of rice and maybe like pay for like a cot somewhere, you know, and then they, the companies that run these shops, these sweatshops or these big corporations that own the sweatshops, right? They make up just obscene amounts of money off of the shit that they pay laborers almost nothing to produce. And you happen to think that that's totally like 
a voluntary thing and there's no, you know, compulsion or there's no, uh, you know, uh, pressure on these people to work in these sweatshops when the reality is, in a lot of cases, this is, you know, maybe the only opportunity they have in their country or their, their uh, you know, their region to find any sort of decent work because finance capital has totally taken okay. over all of the industry. There. So we can talk so, about the third world um, in a second. I, I want to just go back to the beginning of what you said here when you said, uh, what, what did you say? Like the the, lab, the value of labor is the, the on cost. On average, listen, is, it, on av I'll say it again. On average, it is exchanged at its value. Labor we're talking about on average is exchanged at its value. What and is its, its value? value determined by? Its value is determined by the value of the quantity of goods required for its reproduction. So hold on, let's take a moment there. The value of something is the value of what it would take to reproduce that thing. Right. That's So how is that not just like a, a circular vacuous statement? Because that's exactly what you're suggesting with your analogy with the chair and the goat. In other words, the chair takes X numbers of X number of hours to build, right? So how many hours would you say you put into building the chair? Five hours. Okay, five hours. So that on the market is roughly equal to, on average, you can't account for every single individual discrepancy, you know, slight different variations in how long, you know, someone might be able to build a chair, uh, you know, much faster than that. Someone, it might take them longer. You know, someone's chair is a little better. Someone's chair is a little shittier. But on average, it takes about five hours to produce a chair, right? Well, on average, it might take the goat farmer and... X number of time to raise the goat with X, you know, number of hours of labor, you know, feet, the labor is less intensive, less specified. You just put food in a dish and the goat eats it and grows. Right. So that what if is more people. That, okay. What if more people want chairs? Okay. So this is when we talk about averages, what I'm saying is you can't account for every single person's difference. This is a no. This is this is a market reality. I'm saying like, what if more like no, all of society wants a chair and one person wants a goat? What's more valuable mm. use of your if you five hours so, building chairs is way more valuable than five hours raising a goat, right? Wait, say that again. What if everybody in society wants a chair, and let's say nobody wants a goat? Don't you agree that it's much more valuable to be building chairs than it is to be raising goats? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, obviously. Let me ask more, it directly. Uh, because the market ask, demands stop, it, right? Stop, let me ask it directly to the communists here. Do you not think that the value of something is at least in part determined by how desirable that thing is to the common man? I think that on a person-to-person -person basis, that's probably the most important factor in determining like individual transactions, right? Like if you really need a bottle of water, you know, you're going to fucking die of thirst. Like when they did that to those people at Woodstock, right, in 99, was it? And they uh, they made it so you couldn't bring your own water in. It was during the summer, and they jacked up the price of water, and the people ended up just buying the water at this ultra-high jacked-up price because they needed fucking water. So, like, of course, yeah, in that scenario, if the demand is really, really high given a particular set of circumstances, of course, you're going to be willing to pay more for it. What I'm saying, though, is that you, get paid you by have the word. to... What's up? Do you get paid by the word? No. Then I... let your comrades answer let, too, please. Let, okay. Can I really quick? I thought I was having a back and forth. I, 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 I want to go, go back and forth for a second. So one more question I have for you. If I can do a brain surgery and it takes me five hours, is that worth more than a brain surgery from someone who can only can do the same thing in two hours? No. Uh, okay, so wait. If it's the same kind of so, do you if think it's the same surgery? Single, so you're saying if the two surgeries are exactly the same, one one surgeon is able to do it in five hours, one surgeon is able to do it in two hours. Yeah. They're both of the exact same skill level. Same quality. Which, well, they're, well they're one of them can do it quicker, right? Well, but I, the I result mean, is the same. The eff efficacy of the surgery, right? Yes. Yeah. The the outcome is like the same. The market demand is the same. One person can do it in five hours. One person can do it in two. Which, so which surgery is worth more? Okay, so let's pretend you're the health insurance company, right? And you are trying to decide which surgeon you're going to cover, uh, whose services you're going to cover, right? Like you are fucking Wix brain surgeon. He definitely needs brain surgery, right? I mean, look at the guy. And, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out which surgeon you're going to cover uh, this surgery for. And you're going to look at both surgeons and you're going to 
base uh, which one you're going to uh, you're going to base their rates and probably a little bit more about like what you know relationship prior relationship you have with that surgeon and you're going to compare that to the market average of what it would cost for that surgery and if one surgeon is drastically overcharging right then you're not going to agree to pay for that you're going to agree to pay for the surgeon who would charge less here's the answer the time it takes you to do the surgery is fucking irrelevant to what, like what the value is of the surgery. If you take 10 hours to do a surgery, that value of the surgery doesn't change. In fact, it could probably even become less valuable because people want time. Time is money. People want more time of their life. And you can do a surgery in two hours. That's better than if you spend 10 hours doing it. In the same way, if you spend 10 hours pounding sand or 10 hours breaking rocks, those rocks aren't like 10 hours worth of value because nobody wants a big fucking pile of broken up rocks. What brings what what value is is a determination from what people want. If I want a chair, what I will trade for that chair that that makes its value. And if enough people all agree, like we all want this for this value, that's what sets a market value. So no, it has nothing to do with the amount of time you put into it. It has got nothing to do with what Adam it takes Smith to replicate that moving you know. forward. I, you so, know, Adam Smith disagrees with you, right? So like the, the whole idea of the labor theory of value is yeah. that it's like value is Adam determined Smith. by socially necessary labor yeah. time. So, so, so not yeah. So, so socially necessary labor time. The, so, and this is somewhat like a fault of Marx and perhaps Adam Smith. I'm pretty sure this also applies to Adam Smith and David. Ruffin. Um, yeah. So these these all these thinkers were prior to the discovery of the subjective value theory, which is that people and which is what most the vast majority of economists by the way who aren't hacks they all accept this which is the value of an item is what people say it is right so if a bunch of people want a chair that chair is worth a fuck ton because a lot of people are willing to give up a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of their life and a lot of trading goods in exchange for that chair and if that's not value then what the fuck is right if i give, well, if i'm willing to trade 30 hours of my life for a chair that chair is now worth 30 hours of someone's life or, or the equivalent, or a, or twenty fucking you want no goats cars, right? If I can trade a car for a chair, and, and this is so obvious when you look at market dynamics, right? Okay, a bunch of people are buying graphics cars because they want to mine Bitcoin. What happens to the price of graphics cars because there's fewer graphics cars to go around? The price goes up because more because there's not as much to go, not as much graphics cards to go around, and so people are willing to give more in order to get that graphics card. Labor theory of value, I mean, it's great for like establishing a base level understanding of where do the rights over property come from, but it's yeah, got right. no base, it's got no basis whatsoever as to like what the actual value of an item is. Because by the way, once people like stop having a, like stop liking an object, the value of that plummets, right? Ham radios aren't worth as much now as they were when they first came out. Same thing with toilets, right? When shit becomes ubiquitous, the value drops because it's not as sought after. It's not as worthwhile. And there's not as much, there's, there's all sorts of like factors here when we look at like the grand like market scheme, but none of this has to do with how much time you put into it. How does this relate to uh, capitalism versus communism? That's what I want to know. Right, because capitalism is an amalgamation of consensual interactions. It's I will give you the chair in exchange for the car. Uh, what the communists say is, no, you can't do that. That's unfair, even though you both want to trade a chair for a car because we know better. And I think that's, that's just, it's paternalistic, right? Like, do I not as a person have like the freedom to make trades when I want? That's quite literally an elementary understanding of communism. Communism doesn't eliminate trade back and forth. It just changes it to where there's no longer money involved and makes it more based off of what the products are actually worth. Wait, it's, can I ask what you, are they Vigilante, actually worth? just really quick, stop, Vigilante. Uh, you, made, you made a statement there, and I'm, I'm curious. Do you think communism doesn't involve money? Well, communism by definition is a stateless, classless society as defined by Marx. So in order to achieve communism, you have to get rid of money. Is it not fair to hold communists responsible for the means and methods by which it would come about, even if those means and methods are distinct from what it will be in the end? Repeat that. <clears throat> if we have to do certain things to enact communism, or when we try to implement communism, certain things happen, I think it's fair to, to hold communism responsible for those things, even if they are definitely not part of communism. For example, if I make a house, right, and the method in which I make that house is incredibly pollutive, right? It leads to all this trash going in the river. You point at this trash, you'd be like, look, 
your house, put all this trash in the river. Like, trash in the river, that's not a house. A house definitionally is the walls and the floor, right? I think the means by which we achieve these processes and these results need to be considered. So while it might be true that communism itself doesn't involve that, are you really going to say that like the way in which we get to communism doesn't involve restrictions on currency or markets or trading? I mean, capitalism is just as guilty with the with the means and ends. I never said. Okay, hold on. You need to answer the question. Yes or no? Is it fair to hold communism responsible for those things, even if the, you know, those things are distinct from what the textbook definition of communism is? It would be fair to hold that state accountable. I just think it's very foolish for us to look at achieving an end. Uh, a specific process and see that process pretty reliably do certain things and for us to then completely divorce that process from outcomes uh, even if they're divorced from what the intended outcome is. Can you be more right? specific? Uh, yeah, so, it, so, so if we try to implement communism 100 times and in 98 out of 100 times we end up seeing restrictions on markets, on currency on the ability to trade, on the ability to freely associate, then that is a fair thing to consider. Now you might still say, hey, it's worth it because you're absolutely right. I think capitalism does involve some of that. I am not, you know, some free market, I total, total free markets, I love a little bit of government control. But we still need to then have that conversation. We would need to say, okay, well, the ways in which we achieve communism that cause these things, are they good? Are they bad? Is it worth it? Do the ends justify the means? That would be the debate we need to have. It wouldn't be, well, that's not actually part of the end result of communism, so therefore it has no relevance. Obviously, it has some relevance if the way in which we get to communism causes those things. Well, I mean, it's just a historical process to get to communism. Like, it's just it's in the same yes. way that there, that there was a historical process to get to capitalism. But some processes are different. Some processes are better than others. And if we're going to evaluate getting to a thing, we need to evaluate the process. And some processes are better than, uh, worse than others. And again, I'm not saying, oh, their communism involves some restrictions on currency and markets. Egad. But, like, we need to at least be able to get to that point where we agree, yes, if we're going to do communism, one of the impacts is going to be restrictions on currency, on markets, on trade. That's okay. We can then have that debate or those justified controls. But, like, we need to be willing to admit that. It's I mean, during the, during the transitionary states, I mean, there would definitely be those restrictions on markets and... Then it goes back to Lactoid's point, if we can philosophically fundamentally justify that, given the fact that we seem to have agreed that a person is not obligated someone uh, merely by existing someone else's uh, time. Here, here's what I never understood about like the money thing. And this is just like a, it's not even like a political, it's just like a, I, thought the, I think the money thing is just like a weird idea because, so let's go back to like the analogy of me giving somebody a chair for a car. Um, but like moving a car and moving a chair, depending on how big the chair is, can be fucking difficult, right? So what if I put down on a piece of paper, like uh, I owe you one share, and then I walked over to the person with the car and I gave them that note, would you get rid of my ability to do that? Because that's all money what is. What the fuck? <laughs> all, all money is, <laughs> is an I, all money. It, yeah, look, money is like the the universal equivalent, right? Like it's uh, it only has value because it represents a, a percentage of commodities that you can exchange it for, right? And then that can be exchanged for money, you know, like that can further be goods exchanged for money in return, right? Or goods and services or whatever. Yeah, we all agree with that. And actually, I don't, I don't, I think that what my uh, my buddy Vigilante is is trying to get at more is that this is like a long term you know, goal of communism at the highest, highest, highest stage of our development, then there will be, you know, no need for, for money because, you know, there will be such an overabundance of resources and all our material needs, needs will be met in such an efficient, effective way that we won't ever need money. And that's clear, you know, at least I, I think we all agree. I mean, my buddies can jump in if they disagree, but w that's probably not going to be seen in our lifetime, even under the best conditions, best case scenario, right? Uh, as communists in 2023, what we're referring to is not immediately implementing a classless, stateless society right away where the commodity form is destroyed and money is destroyed and everything's perfect and a utopia. But what we're hoping for is a general transition from this, you know, anarchic system of production that we have now, where it's basically, in many ways, survival of the fittest. Everybody's just on your own. If you don't make it, you're fucked and it's your own fault. Uh, which most deeply impacts people in the third world, as I mentioned earlier. Can I stop uh, you right there? Transi no, you can't, because I gotta fucking say the whole shit, bro. And then we're oh, we're God. looking to transition from the current 
system that we're in into one that's more equitable and the only way to do that is through an effective efficient distribution of resources let me let's so going back going back one sentence when you said uh you know capitalism has this idea of like you're independent you're on your own kind of like thought process let me go back to my original question do you think anybody simply by virtue is existing is owed the labor of somebody else so the one thing that I, and I disagreed with you that before, I know where you're going with it. Well, you agreed. I think you're missing, I think you're missing in, in uh, no, I agreed with you before on that. And I think you're, yeah, I'm getting confused. My mistake. But I think what you're leaving out in a lot of your abstract examples is you're assuming that all of these people who come together to do different exchanges or make economic decisions are operating in some sort of like vacuum where no other factor like impacts them. Like, why do people need a chair? You know, what is like, they a, value sitting why down. does someone need a goat? Why does someone choose to they value uh, no, have a, certain fifth. needs or certain wants or whatever? All of this stuff, like a human being is, is a socially produced thing. Like all the, to be a socialist means understanding the totality of your being. Wait, are you the are millions you, well, well, of well, ways well, in which you're connected quickly, to other I'm people? Because I'm confused what you're saying. And, and let me clarify, because I, if I'm confused, I think my audience might be confused too. Are you saying that the only reason that someone would desire a chair or a car or a goat or whatever is because they've been socialized to? No, no, no. Oh. That, that's, that's like postmodern no. bullshit. What okay. I'm saying is like, okay, so somebody who might want a chair... Uh, in, in the same example that Lactoid was giving before, like I could argue like, well, you could just build your own chair. But the reality is most people can't build their own chair because A, they don't know how to build a chair. They never spent their life learning how to build chairs. B, they don't have access to wood or tools or know how to use them. You know, C, the chair that's made by someone else might be better than what they're able to make. That's what I mean. Like all of our economic decisions are determined by, you know, various social factors, which you know, form to be the, the sum of who we are, right? And when we come to the marketplace, all of those factors uh, play into every interaction. So when we are talking about things like the labor theory of value, or we're talking about like, you know, the consequences of the, this anarchic, you know, system of production that uh, impacts people and how we need to resolve these inequalities, the reason for that is because all of this stuff is like deeply connected, right? Like we're all connected. Okay, we don't in... have to elucidate every single connection Look, brief we have like six people on this panel you can't take up every fucking second of the time we need to let other people in please oh my god dude, this is so fucking ridiculous all right uh ultimately what he's trying to get at is that no individual exists in a vacuum and so these individualized metaphors they don't they're, they're not useful they don't make a lot of sense <laughs> We're talking, we about, a, no, no, we're no, talking no, about no. an actual social system. We're not talking a, a, about So you, we, can, we can aggregate this to like a larger system. So like in the same way we have one person trading a chair for a, for a uh, car, like we could have like right. a, whole so bunch of, a whole bunch of people who want cars and a whole bunch of, bunch of people who want chairs. And then you have people who are going out and making this shit and trading with each other. I mean, and you get, you get enough people and you keep this going, you're going to get like a capitalist economy, right? With people like making shit and trading shit. That's what it is. Well, no, like mercantile trading has existed long before capitalism. So, and if, so this may be like a definitional thing. Like what I'm arguing is that capitalism as it exists, as I understand it, and as it exists, or at least should exist, is um, more of a lack of a system as opposed to a system, right? It's merely like we're going to protect people's rights. And then we're not going to interfere with their consensual decisions with each other. So if I want to trade whatever the fuck for whatever the fuck, I should be able to, um, you know, and, you know, and you could even you don't even have to go fucking full libertarian if you don't want to. Right. You can simply say, well, you should be able to trade what you want with people like for a consensual basis unless someone's going to die. Right. We got to give some people food stamps. Right. You know, th that's a different argument. Um, you could still advocate for that and not be like hold the political ideology that you guys appear to hold. Um, but I mean, for the most part, if we're talking about something like a chair, right, with something where we're, we're talking about, like, I just want to sit down, like, what is wrong with me going to somebody and saying, hey, I will give you for that chair, I'll give you uh, this car, right? Is there, you, you agree with me, there's nothing wrong with this, right? In a complete vacuum, no. And even, in, even not okay, in a complete let me, vacuum. Let me be more clear, because I'm curious to, to um, uh, Valmet, Valmet, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's fine. 
what you mentioned in a complete vacuum. So what about the current context of of the world of the states we live in makes it problematic now, right? In the real world, why is that a problem in the real world, not in a vacuum, but now? Because it's not a practical exchange. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as no one. No one has ever traded a chair for a car. I've traded a table for a chair. Same principle. Okay, uh, but like, okay, so we're talking about my, I, the reason I have an issue is when you say it's a fair and consensual exchange, right? Yes. Whereas under capitalism, you have people who have been left out uh, for, for one reason or another. They do not have access. They, ha they do not have equitable access to, uh, to things that sustain life, like healthcare, like shelter, right? And then people die because they can't afford healthcare and shelter. And this is, this is called social murder. People die because of this system. So I assume you're not just advocating for like, it's, maybe I'm wrong, but you're not just advocating Actually, for like- you're talking a lot, bro. Make sure your uh, teammates yeah, yeah, get them on the action, dude. Hey, they're free to jump yeah. in anytime. Zero, okay. Zero. They're, they're free to jump in anytime. Um, I want to, the reason I'm trying to stick with like the chair and table, like an uh, example is because while I will go down any avenue you want, as like a as a base uh, and uh, intelligent libertarian, um, there's a lot of people might not want to go down those certain roads when it comes to like people's lives at stake, like so for food stamps or healthcare stuff like that. But even if we put those aside for a second, like the like what people consider to be like the necessities, and we talk about like a chair and a table. If I have a chair, regardless of like you know, let's say I came about it consensually, but I you know I have one. There is nothing wrong with me going to somebody with a table and saying, I'm going to give you this chair and you're going to give me this table. You agree there's no reason that the government should be involved in this transaction whatsoever. Can you just right? shut the fuck up about the chair already? We get the point. Well, yeah. once I get an answer. I, well, okay, fine. I don't Sure. Here's my, here's, I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better. Let's say I'm dangling off a branch on the edge of a cliff and someone says, hey, I'll save your life. Okay, great. But you have to give me $500,000 to do it. Uh, like, well, no, I don't have that. Okay, bye. Sorry, I guess you're dead. Okay, but Lactoid already hand waved things that are required for the necessity of life. He's trying to make a much more difficult argument uh, that we're trying to get to, which is that would you still object to these kinds of markets and exchange of goods, even when it isn't someone's life at stake, when it is a, t a chair for a table? And let's, and let's refocus and remember where this conversation came from, which is about selling your labor. Right. It's not the $500,000 that you don't have in your, your bank account. It's working at the, the best job that is now the best job in this area because of global capitalism, that is now a better job than any of the jobs that were there. And this, this kind of like refocusing, we feel like we just keep shifting from like America abroad, America abroad, third world, okay, wow, is the third world less wealthy than the first world? Yeah, that's kind of often how we define them. It's not like a, it's not, it's not something that happened. That's just like, that's how we define it. But I was describing China, how it's rapid, uh, uptake of the capitalism pill and their poverty massively decreased. Their level of ability for ordinary citizens to afford not only the necessities of life, but as Marx talked about, the reproduction of labor includes a certain standard of living, which includes, like I said, in America and lots of places in the world, flat screen TVs, vacations, traveling, Let's doing go. all these cool things, right? These are things that Marx talked about. Well, he didn't say flat screen TVs. He said like whatever CRT or some shit, right? But sure, can I, I just, can I respond to the, the sure, China please. thing? I just want to make a quick point. The vast right. majority of poverty that was lifted out of China was in the 50s and 60s under, um, under Mao, under a nationalized planned economy, right? And it was the Deng reforms later on that would introduce capitalism. I just want to make that clear. Well, so, so these, I was these numbers, these numbers that talk about people getting lifted out of poverty during the 20th century, the vast majority was in China. Okay, so the numbers that I was talking about were from 90 to 2023, where the um, rate of poverty in 1990 or 1993 was like 98.2%. And that was under the $550 rate, you were saying $10 would be the rate, which would put it, I don't know, 90 99% or something, right? Um, so uh, maybe in the 50s, things got like significantly better than they were. But under the standard that you were talking about and the standard that you were saying for these different organizations, the UN, the UN um, they would still be under the poverty rate. But under a capitalist system, they got to actually not being impoverished. So 
um, maybe we can talk about, you know, I, I don't know what it was like in the 50s. Maybe they were able to spread the limited wealth around to, the, to an extent that people weren't as kind of fucked over as they were before that. But we're talking about people getting to an actual, like closer to a first world standard of living where people are not just surviving, but actually have some amount of breathing room. And that, that feels like that should be the, the objective, not just kind of base survival. Okay, you can afford the goats you need it, to survive. Specifically when it comes to the numbers in the 50s in China, I think this actually goes to a point that non-smoker was making originally, which is I think a very smart one in regards to famines or other things. We need to have a more nuanced view than something happens in a communist country. It's the benefit of communism or it's the fault of communism. The same for capitalism. The reality is that China in the 1950s was coming into the first period where they really weren't being absolutely destroyed by imperialism uh, for the first time in almost 100 years. This is actually taught as a century of humiliation in Chinese history. Um, and there's a real case to be made that after the Opium Wars uh, into the Boxer Wars and then the invasion of Imperial Japan, that China would never really had a chance to properly industrialize. So a lot of the attribute, uh, you can attribute a lot of the gains, not to communism or to socialism or to capitalism or to any system, but just the technological progress that the rest of the world had already wrought. That was finally, the Chinese were finally able to actually uh, use their themselves. I'm okay with that position. Yeah. Uh, my pro my the point is then it becomes like who, who creates this technology? Where does this technology come from? I would well, argue I think that, that still does leave a bunch of the numbers that Socrates is talking about from the 90s forward under the reforms of Deng Xiaoping, and specifically Hu Yaobang and Zhao Zilang. I always fucked that pronunciation up. Uh, that really did lead to a lot of the newer growth that we've seen. And I think that can be attributed to capitalism because they were specifically using those kinds of principles to open up markets with limited economic zones. Um, so I, I feel it's necessary to jump in to clarify that when I was talking about the relationship between economic systems and famines before, the point I was trying to make is that no economic system, no political system has like some sort of monopoly on famines, right? Like they're not, it's not like they Thank have Thank you for the raids, my bug. Dirty people in chat, hell yeah, come on I in. Just get rid of them. We are but, uh, learning. You know, with China, in terms of their economic Africa. development in, in the 50s, and, and Valmet is, is definitely correct about this, is that communism. you have to remember, first of all, they're starting at like basically, as you mentioned, kind of square one, right? Like there is almost no industrial development in China. They're an extremely poor, you know, feudal based rural economy where almost nobody has uh, the literacy rate is extremely low. The life expectancy is low relative to the rest of the world. Um, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of like serious systemic problems in China that under communism, under a socialist mode of development, they basically resolved within a couple decades. It was like a miraculous economic turnaround. Now, were they a first world country? No. I mean, they were a developing country, a rapidly developing country. And it is true that market liberalization under Deng Xiaoping uh, in the 80s and then well into the 90s under, you know, other Zhang Zemin and other leaders in China, they were able to just explode, you know, in terms of their growth. The thing is, no communist disputes that capitalism uh, creates explosive economic growth. The problem is it also results in inequality, and that's just something that you can't get around. And it's actually most true in China. Uh, there's been a tremendous uh, amount of inequality in China, despite the fact that their uh, economy has grown in such an enormous amount in such a small period of time. And now the Chinese government now is basically looking at how they can implement different reforms and changes to resolve that inequality. Okay, right? That's so a question. That's a question. That's like, let's 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 talk about that. The inequality uh, does capitalism, by its nature, create inequality, and is that necessarily something that we need to avoid? Right? Like, is inequality in and of itself uh, something that the government should step in to correct? What do you think, capitalists? I'm no. curious. No, why not? No, why I, not? I, I don't think the problem is not inequality. The problem is when people cannot get the services or goods that they need. For example, I think we can all imagine a world. I'm, I'm pretty sure we could get to a hypothetical that everyone here would agree that we, they would be okay with, that it contained a huge amount of equality, where even the base floor um, is uh, such high, such that people are not worrying for housing, worrying for healthcare, worrying for food, things like that. The reality is that there is a problem with the distribution of goods, no matter what kind of system you have. A perfect allocation uh, is just not going to happen. And I think sort of to Lactoid's definition of capitalism merely being the absence of restrictions and systems, the explosion of inequality under capitalism just points to the fact that it's very difficult to make a chaotic world that is fundamentally unequal, very equal, even in an advanced society such as we have today. 
I want to agree with that uh, to some extent. I, I, inequality, I, again, because I don't think that somebody is entitled to the other per, someone else's labor, just simply by virtue of existing. Um, whenever you don't engage in some kind of redistribution, of course, you're going to have like more inequality than if you engage in forced redistribution, right? If you have two people and one person, let's say, they have a whole bunch more stuff or they have more work ethic or whatever the fuck, right? They got a whole bunch. You take a whole bunch of what they got and you give it to the other person. Of course, it's going to be more, quote unquote, equal. Um, but I don't necessarily think it just being equal is necessarily a just thing. I think it depends on the methods. And I think it depends on if you're respecting people's fundamental rights when you're engaging in these interactions. The other thing, and we don't have to get super into this because this is going to be like, uh, this is going to be just, again, the kind of number fencing, which I don't want to do. But um, I just want to challenge one statement that was made about like uh, China, right? My understanding is that in 1980, the, po the severe poverty rate in China was over 85%. It was almost 88%. And now, like since they've been implementing the market reforms, it's down to less than one or perhaps about 1%. So you have the, the largest decline of poverty in China was not during Mao, who implemented ridiculous policies. Um, like killing the birds and limiting children, the families to one child. Um, most of the reduction of poverty came after China started implementing more market reforms. I'm not a fan of China, so I'm not going to like back them in anything they do. But uh, I just empirically, I just wanted to challenge a statement because somebody reached out to me and said that was just false and gave me some sources on it. So um, no, I don't think that's a point for like a Marxist economy. I think it actually is the opposite, right? Okay, uh, just China... out of curiosity, since Smugbug is here, uh, the communists, um, do you think China is a communist country or is it state capitalist? I'm just curious. State capitalist. Yeah, uh, I don't. There's actually, yeah. I mean, okay. there's, there's, there's this, like, I have this discussion on my channel all the time, but uh, no, I'm inclined to not accept it as a socialist country because the working class does not collectively what, own I, the means of production okay so it's too if successful that's case, the if that's the case what <laughs> would you consider to be a modern communist society a modern communist society yeah like that exists today today can you point to a nation country or institution in the world that you would consider to be communist by your definition um no not really. Uh, I mean, yeah. Cuba, might, Cuba, maybe Vietnam are the closest things we have. Cuba or and... Vietnam. What, what about the rest of you? Uh, uh, vigilante, uh, what do you think? I would agree Cuba and Vietnam are probably the closest things that we have. Okay. At least to uh, socialism. Non-smoker, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I actually uh, disagree with, with both of my buddies here. I consider China the socialist country. Um, and, you know, I... I I think that I, I guess I'd call it my copium for that, is the idea that I don't think that it's realistic to say socialism is a prescribed set of like uh, parameters that have to be implemented perfectly. You know, these are systems that were meant to be, uh, well, in reality need to be adapted to the conditions of that country. So socialism with Chinese characteristics is not, you know, orthodox uh, to Marx or any other, you know, typical, uh, I guess, framework of socialism. It's been adapted to the needs of the Chinese people. Uh, and with that comes some liberalization of markets, uh, special economic zones, for example. Um, I think that that's something that has been incredibly powerful for China okay. and their growth. But at the same time, they have, you know, five-year economic plans. They have uh, a significant percentage of their company, uh, their economy gotcha. are uh, state-owned enterprises. Okay. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but yeah, please don't. Uh, to the, I, to the before, yeah, before, you want someone making sense, so, right? Before you do so, okay. Uh, the reason I ask that question, okay, is for the follow-up question, which is considering that there are so few modern communist nations, right? Why do you think that is? Why aren't the people longing for freedom and 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 and, and taking up the reins and modeling our why why isn't the United States modeling itself after uh, these communist nations that, in your opinion, I would assume, are better places to live than America? Because every time a democratic country elects a socialist leader, there are uh, coups, assassinations, invasions, embargoes, massive amounts of imperialism, and massive amounts of cutting off. 
and and, and um, yeah, uh, largely CIA, okay. especially Latin America. Um, yeah, like if what do you if think uh, like yeah. like if if you truly believe in democracy and freedom, you, you, you would leave the fucking thought wick. Jesus Christ, dude. If you truly believe in democracy and freedom, then the United States should, by all means, allow these countries to experiment uh, with their own version of socialism. Okay. But they can't do that because because uh, the you know the capitalist ruling class and you know the Republican and Democratic Party are like they're two sides of the same coin of capitalism and imperialism. They like by definition cannot allow countries that they have material interests in to democratically decide uh, to govern themselves. I want I want to hear the capitalist response to this. It's a, that's an accusation, right? Um, what do you think, gang? I, I mean, think. Uh, or, go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead. No, 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 no. I talked more. You go. You go first. Uh, <laughs> um, shouldn't the um, American duopoly uh, be able to experiment with um, interfering with other other countries? Isn't that an experiment that uh, politically should be should be allowed to be run if they have the freedom to um, try out their own their own forms of government? Shouldn't uh, our elected leaders be able to interfere with their government as well in a kind of experimental fashion? No. <laughs> try, give, give it a try, Flo Trace. Flo yeah, Trace. Well, I, yeah, I think Socrates is doing it in a meme way because uh, he's smarter than that. But he's a real point. Um, look, I'm going to totally 100% morally disavow a lot of the fucked up actions the United States has taken uh, when it comes to Latin American countries. Thank but you. it's undeniable Thank that you. if we look at the way in which ideologies play out across the world, your success rate, your batting rate does matter. Um, the reality is that when it comes to this level of power politics, um, morality tends to get left by the wayside. And that's not a good thing, but this is not true of just one side, right? Um, it's not the case that, for example, um, left-leaning communist or socialist countries have not had immense power that they have tried to use to influence other countries as well. The Soviet Union was one of the most powerful and terrifying entities in the history of the planet. Or if you look at, for example, Angola and the intervention Cuba took there. Um, this is unfortunately, it's not moral on both sides, I 100% agree, but if one side is overwhelmingly succeeding in another, then I do think, unironically, that is a point to consider as to whether or not the ability of yourself, uh, of a country to project your power when all countries attempt to do so, moral or moral, um, is consistently failing in one type of ideolo ideology and succeeding in the other. Um, I wanted to so I don't like to really go down this kind of angle of, um, well, this country failed because it was communist, right? I mean, there's a lot, there's a host of reasons why countries fail. I think, um, I mean, you could theoretically have, I mean, there's a good point made that, you know, there are international consequences that come when you have like a bad government come into place or like a government that's infringing on people's rights come into place. Um, so even if you could find one that, which I don't think there really is one that's like very successful, but even if you could find one that's very successful, I don't think that would be like an indicator that we should move more towards communism. I think it's a indication that communism has grown to be a greater threat, right? In the same way, you know, it, like, well, there's not a lot of countries that practice slavery anymore. Yes. And good. Right. Because we don't want that. We don't a want threat. Like, we don't, can, and, can I, and, like to add real quick, a greater threat. Can you, what is the threat of communism? You. Yes. If a, so, if another country had slavery, and like they were trying to propagate slavery in the countries around them, regardless of if they were successful or not, I would be highly opposed to them because I don't want them to have slavery, and I don't want a world with like with more slaves. That's not good, right? In the same way, if we have a very successful communist country that's pushing communism, right? Because I think there's a strong like similarity between the two between communism and, sl and slavery. Um, so yeah, them being successful just simply represents them being a greater of a threat. So I don't know how much of their success is dictated by their internal failures compared to like external pressure. I think the better art, like the better, the better argument is even if they thank God they're not successful, because even if, because if they were successful, then we would have a greater threat in our hands in the same way. Thank God Hitler wasn't uh, successful for the exact same reason. Even if you could point to like be certain beneficial policies that he had. Uh, I would say most communist. I would just to respond. Most communist movements um, in, the, in the last hundred years were, in part, uh, designed to overthrow their colonizers, right? Not to invite them in. Um, socialism is has an internationalist perspective, which means our job and a task is to empower and educate the working class around the world to take power into their own hands, not invade another country and take them over. I think we would all be opposed to that. I'm okay with like invading other countries if they're terrible, right? I'm okay. I was okay with invading Nazi Germany. I was okay with invading Korea. 
And we should be in, we should be protecting people regardless of where they are in the world, because someone's rights don't stop mattering if they happen to be across some invisible line in the same. The South. Yes, I was also okay with invading the South. Hell That's another yeah. great example, um, right? America Roll in, you free the slaves, or we're fucking. Oh uh, yeah. America has 800 military bases around the world. I think they're the biggest threat uh, to freedom around the world. Would you be okay since America sucks? That would you be okay if America got invaded? So I would only be okay, I would only be okay with America getting invaded if it was invaded by a more libertarian country. Then I would be okay with it. I just don't think one exists right now. Switzerland's planet. coming Jesus for a slice, dude. Maybe Switzerland if they could. <laughs> Communists with ideologues. So there's so there's something you can say. So uh, um, I apologize for my meme meme so response so. earlier, but um, I I think there there is something legitimately that you can say. Um, okay. Um, Things that we want about a country. Obviously, we want it to be like morally good. We want it to treat its its people well. But we also want it to be a stable, strong, functioning society. Whatever system we think is good, we want it to be stable. And if it seems like it's a fact of history that capitalist countries or capitalist societies are more stable or are able to um, repel foreign influence better, it's something worth considering. I'm, I'm not saying this is the only thing that we should consider, but something worth considering. Is this a, like a weakness of communism that it's so easy to destabilize that it kind of collapses so quickly with or with it, without foreign intervention? I, I, I do think that is a, a fair criticism worth, make, worth making. Just to respond to the military bases point, I, I'm, certain, I'm certain that of the many, 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 many Overseas military bases the United States have some are unjustified, but I think we need to take a more nuanced view than just throwing them onto the bus. Because the reality is there's a lot of those that are wanted by the nation that they're occupied in. Um, so I don't think it's fair to just throw all of those out as like some sort of a sign of like an overreaching empire, right? Mm -hmm. um, going back to Lactoid's point, that's just, you know, two cons uh, uh, free acting entities in the form of governments consensually engaging in what they think is a fair exchange. Let's talk about this consensual uh, issue and talk about uh, like, uh, let's get onto the foreign policy thing because I'm, 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 very curious what the there's been some say. point on that before we move off of it yeah briefly okay, thanks today. yeah because so yeah because you let lactoid talk for like a minute so, so i just want to get my minute in yeah if that's cool uh but anyway it's lactoid so my question would be this hypothetical libertarian country that would invade how many chairs would you produce in exchange for goats for them whatever the going rate for goats is oh so like the average no, the average, whatever the like rate. A socially is. determined no, average. What, what, no, the, the no, 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 oh, no, wow, no, wow. no. Okay, never mind. I'm good. So what, whatever, whatever, any individual, whatever, whatever any individual um, would trade me a chair. Sounds super chair cool, chair. dude. Can't wait to do my chair trade in the, uh, you know, hypothetical universe that doesn't exist. Who okay. Discount Haas. Jesus Christ. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna push that to the side because I don't know what that was about. I don't care either. Uh, let's talk about China and Taiwan. Right. Uh, when we talk about uh, country. things that uh, Taiwan, there there's the their solidarity Taiwan people, right? Absolutely would love the American military to come in, right? They would, they would be begging for us to put a base there. We don't, right? Um, uh, we do have a kind of red line policy where if China were to go and invade Taiwan, we would, we have made it clear that we would intervene and step up, right? Um, and when we look at other, uh, well, uh, Russia is no longer communist, right? Um, it, the USSR fell. However, many of the leaders uh, were part of the uh, old communist regime, the old USSR regime. And look how they are trying to acquire or be imperialistic towards um, uh, Ukraine. Ukraine. Thank you. Sorry, uh, brain fart for a minute. Um I guess the question is, like, when we when we talk about imperialism, right? When we talk about foreign policy, when we talk about consent, it seems to be that, e like, uh, even if we go back to the USSR, like, they were no better than the Americans uh, when it came to imperialism, right? They they engaged in it just as much. Maybe they were less successful, right? But not for lack of trying. Uh, what what do you think, communists? Uh, uh, no. You're totally fucking wrong. It doesn't even remotely compare. I'm sorry. Uh, the USSR yeah. didn't didn't nuke civilians during World War II for one thing. Um, so it, to to they, your first they point, they didn't have like, nukes. Do you, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. yeah, they didn't use nukes because they didn't have nukes. Are you saying that if Stalin in World War II, when Germany invaded them, had had nukes, that they would not have used them? 
Uh, that's I just you know they never a, did war crimes. Ever. That's, histor- that's historical fan fiction at this point. There's no point in speculating on that. Now to get to your first that point, is... the uh, the, no, the but, people. But the reason I brought it, it up, the reason I brought it up, is because you said, "Well, they never did it." Well, yes, they never did it because they didn't yeah. have. Yeah, and them. then you said, and then you said, the USSR <laughs> was just as bad and just as invasive uh, throughout the 20th century as the as the US was. So how come their USSR never used nukes? They got them eventually, and they never used them. The United States also never used nukes in the post-war period. If it's not fair to theorize about whether or not the USSR would have used nukes during World War II, then it's not fair to compare the Americans' usage of said nukes during World War II in opposition to the and non-usage of the Soviet Union. Can all of the places the Soviet Union supposedly imperialized? Afghanistan. That's okay, a big so one. You want to go to, so were you aware of like why the Soviets went into Afghanistan? No justification for war is going to you make know? the conduct of the Soviet Union. No, it doesn't matter, right? If you it's invite me into matters. your house and then I it's kill all your family and skin them alive, no, it doesn't. The if Baltic you states inside of a family and skin them alive. What the fuck are you talking? Wait, wait. About? The, Bal- the Baltic talking states. about the philosophical question of whether or not it? you're invited into a country justifies but, uh, any ju- conduct Baltic you have inside state. that country. But uh, okay, do you want to talk about the Baltic states or you want to talk about Afghanistan? We were Afghanistan first. Like that ahead. was brought up first. And then we can talk about Afghanistan. We can talk about the Baltic states. Okay. Well, Afghanistan had a communist government. And they actually requested Soviet support. Oh, like how countries so request U.S. military requ- bases. Yeah, yeah. So, so wait, wait, wait. So, no, no, no. So, that means it's all okay. If y- your country invites another country in, that country that's come in, they can do whatever they want. They can mow down civilians. They can level city blocks. They can kill people. It's all okay. Well, wasn't the example Wick used earlier about Taiwan? He was trying to argue that like Taiwan would totally accept U.S. military support right now. Wasn't that what Wick was saying? Am I correct in that, Wick? Yeah, the yeah, cons- absolutely. They 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 would beg for it, right? If China. So I I don't think Taiwan is a country, but let me just humor the idea that it is. If Taiwan wants U.S. military support to come in and help them in the case that, you know, there's some sort of like uprising or I don't know, some sort of even invasion by Chinese troops and we go and blow them away or blow away anyone who's sympathetic to the uh, People's Republic of China, I feel like you would be totally fine with that. But because the Soviet Union coming in to support a communist government means killing some people who are trying to overthrow said communist government, you're against that. I think this quote, the fact that you think this question is an ode is so funny because my answer is it would depend. It would depend on your conduct once you're in the country. Just because you're invited to the country by the government, even if it's legitimate government, doesn't give you It was addressed to me, so let me answer it real quick. Yes, if America came in and started mowing down civilians in Taiwan, if if they started assassinating people, they started nuking cities, if they started, like, uh, uh, building mass graves, yes, that would be terrible and I would oppose it. But the conduct of countries are not the same. The conduct of the uh, the United States, right, in, in various countries, uh, sometimes have been horrific, right? Uh, if we look at South America, they've done some horrific things there, I will grant you, right? But when we, like, when we look at USSR and Afghanistan, and we, USSR and in these other countries, man, do you want to, do you want to uphold that? Like, I don't, Okay, uh, the, the whole point I'm trying to make, and I feel like it's kind of being dismissed, but it's really crucial. If you look up the Sour Revolution in Afghanistan, which happened in 1978, there was a communist government in Afghanistan, and they were requesting support from the Soviet Union. Now, in terms of anything that happened in that war, am I saying that there weren't, you know, uh, violations of human rights in war? Uh, no, I, I think that happens in almost every war. But it's, it's it, you know, it was at the important part is it was requested support versus in America's case where we went all over the fucking world in many countries where we were not welcome and did precisely what you're asserting the Soviets did with mountains of evidence that we did that. I mean, we talked about Latin America uh, earlier, but what about Southeast Asia? Just even in an effort to contain the influence of communist China, expanding the heroin trade, bombing Laos and Cambodia. I mean, you know, you could go on and on the shit that we did in the name of U.S. imperialism. What about Korea? We killed 20 percent of their population. Like, you know, how does that at all compare to anything the Soviet Union did in one conflict? In During Afghanistan? the course Before... of the Korean War, 20 percent of the population died. So, that is so... a far different thing than America killed 20 percent of North of of Korean population. Whoa, whoa, whoa. population. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I also want to point out the double standard. Something. Here. The South Korean government invited the United States. So our so, conduct's all good. Our well, conduct's well, all well, good. Well, not That's only not only that. Time. 
not only that, but the intervention force in Korea was a UN force uh, that came to South defend Korea them the against country. the. Def okay, I'll I'll, I'll I'll go with let's go with the assumption that South Korea is in fact a country. They invited the U.S. or they invited the U.S. and the U.N. to come to their country and defend them, right, against a invading puppet South state. Korea was created against all the an, on the invading map in the U.S. State yeah, Department. It's in, not yes, a country, and it never so was. In, uh, it was <laughs> the, North, the, the North that? Korean, the North Can Korean, that? sir. Yes. Let me let me okay, finish. explain. Let me finish. What's the historical legitimacy of South Korea prior to the U.S. Yeah. literally give me, give me drawing a, a line yeah, on the fucking map and creating it? So my understanding was that the line was like an agreed upon line. So the Soviet Union could have their little, the Soviet Union could have their little, the Soviet, the, the, Soviet, the, Soviet, the Soviet Union could have their little like Korean puppet state, uh, like Marxist puppet state. They're, 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 they're imperialist. Totally That's great. You can save it for when I'm done explaining it. And then you can say it's wrong all you want. We've been talking so, a while. I just don't want you to, you know, use well, up too much time in the panel. Yeah. So you're very salty. Notice how I haven't been brought up. I haven't brought up how much you've talked at all. I don't know. Maybe you got like a thing. You've reached thick. a little of your state you're a lot of speaking just, time. Yeah, just, so you're, like, you're, like, well, you're, you're doing that like uh, commie thing of like lashing out at everyone else, not just it's, going it's to the Wick and Wick Wick and his cowardly ways. Who's okay, well, well then go after, go after Wick and stop interrupting me. I'm just being passive aggressive. Oh, I think you're being more than passive aggressive. I could tell. I'm being aggressive towards you, passive aggressive towards Wick. It's okay. Wick invited him here. His conduct is going to be good no matter what. On top of I am aggressive towards Wick. Zone being burned down in the protest. I had, I did nothing but and a collateral damage, whatever. I don't so, know what the fuck you're talking so, about. So get to your point, how yeah. is South Korea a legitimate I, state? Did you just say get to, to my that. point? Did you just say get to my point? That's, that's yeah. Please perfect. hurry. You're wasting a lot of airtime. Yeah, really. So before the UN and the US came to uh, protect, so protect the South against the Soviet puppet state, that uh, imperialistic puppet state, I mind you, um, from invading the South. Right, or the North invaded the South, and then the UN and the US intervened and prevented that from happening. That's like anti-imperialistic, right? Because they're preventing another country from coming in and dictating their government structure over the South. Is that not anti-imperialist? Are you familiar with Syngman Rhee's persecution of communists in South Korea prior to the war? I, I fully understand the government of Sigmund Rhee. Oh, I mean, understand it wasn't, fully, I was, it wasn't fully democratic in the exact same way. The it North was, was also like fully. They literally fully, jailed and executed communists. Yes, yes the North. So the North was also jailing. The popular and sovereignty of the Korean people would have been to elect Kim Il sung. Man, you got alpha energy, bro. Man, I, I don't know how to convey well, no, you. Just, anyway, all you, that you're tea, just, your you're hair like a massive fuck. Enough, fucking cuck, enough, bro. enough. Okay, we've we've had our little back and forth. We've had our little fun. I couldn't finish your point, Lactoid. That's right. Right. I'm giving you space to finish your point, yeah. and then the commies can respond. But you have to finish. Be yeah. brief, concise. Go ahead. Thank you for preventing him from imperializing this conversation. So, uh, my whole point is there's a double standard here, which is there's plenty of examples of communist imperialism. And it's not imperialism when they do it, but it's imperialism when the West does it. So the North Koreans, well, that's, you know, that's obviously not imperialism. That's the will of the Korean people. Uh, North Vietnam, that's the will of the Vietnamese people, right? The Baltic states, oh, they, they wanted communism. They wanted to be part of the Soviet Union. You know, that, that's, that's truly what they wanted. Uh, the Ukraine, you know, all, Poland, like these are all countries and the entire Iron Curtain, right? We want to talk about imperialism. Uh, imperialism is merely one country you know, exerting its control and will over another country. It's, this has nothing to do with like a government structure and has everything to do with like international power dynamics. So yeah, any country with any kind of governmental structure or any kind of economic structure can imperialize another country. It's not unique to communism. It's not unique to capitalism. Just accept that it happens on both sides. That's it. Was that so hard? Okay, uh, respond if you will. Who, me? Whoever or wants to fucking group. respond, I don't care. Someone talk. Is there I mean, is there anyone I mean, who would like to tackle on the communist side? Whether yeah, I, don't, they think I, don't, I don't want to South speak Korea, over it when we just had a capitalist going, but is there anyone on the communist side who also believes that South Korea is still like not a country? Dude, people in South Korea don't even think that. They all look at it as uh, a unified <laughs> peninsula. They don't. They don't. They all no, the Korean they don't. people. The Korean people want a unified Korea. Now, there's considerable disagreement on how exactly to implement that and 
you know, do people in South Korea universally want the Kim? You regime just moved the goalposts in real time. We just Wait, went from South Koreans look, don't think South Korea is a real country to they you know, want YouTube unification. Does, does seconds, the UN recognize South Korea as a country? Destroy. Dude, when I said it wasn't a country, the point I'm trying to make is particular to, first of all, prior to the Korean War. But second of all, I'm trying to make, uh, you know, it clear that there isn't some like long standing, you know, uh, meaningful South Korean state formation that has any legitimacy. It was literally a colonial project. This was America coming in, dividing up this former colonial possession of the Japanese and saying, we're going to take this territory and basically create a satellite to stop communism from spreading into this further into this part of the world. So There's today, of course, you know, decades later, uh, where they've implemented, you know, systems of nominal democracy and all of this stuff, it has more legitimacy now than it did prior to, or especially around its formation. But the the point is that this is like an arbitrary state formation. Neither North or South Korea want to be divided. All states are arbitrary. Yes, but some have more historical legitimacy than I don't, others. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Like uh, this historical no, it legitimacy. Does matter. Does it does matter. It does matter. It does. Not the world me. is not Go a on. risk map where you can just decide what is or isn't valid. There's some historical integrity. The people to who borders. live there can. The people who live in a location can we absolutely and should absolutely right be able to, to decide. We, right? The to Korean some people the right to do that. We didn't let them decide, you fucking idiot. The North Koreans tried to stop them from deciding it. Absolutely. Dude, we stopped the them and we upheld were, the South Koreans. South uh, Koreans. Consent. They were all Koreans. Why are you okay with violating the consent of Korean people? Dude, the people in Why the Why are North you okay with violating the consent of the, the Koreans? Is that you're saying all Koreans are the same? Stupid. That kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. What? Korea is a country. South Korea is a country. Just want to make that clear. So is Taiwan. Thank you. No, it's not. And Taiwan is definitely not. And neither is Kosovo. No, Spoker, can I ask you a legitimate Sorry, I, question? I meant, I meant real China. Sorry, not because China. Because you're... Real China. Other questions you've asked me? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, all of the warrants you're giving are a lot more nuanced than your initial claims of South Korea isn't a country. South Korea has no legitimacy. And then you'll say, well, it has le had less legitimacy. Or, well, it wasn't democratic. Right yeah, now, like do you think... Right now, do you think that the current government of South Korea has legitimacy through popular sovereignty? Or does it not? I think it has more legitimacy than the initial South Korean state formation, of course. Does it have enough to justify its existence? Is it an illegitimate state? I think that the popular will of the Korean people is to have a unified Korean state. That didn't answer my question. Is it's it a legitimate the, state? It's the important point. Is it a legitimate no, state? It, well, you know, it's legitimate in, in all of the ways that you would expect a state's legitimacy to be measured. You guys mentioned it's a UN member. You measured it's a, you know, a trading oh, partner. come on. Recognized. You don't believe in any of that bullshit. Do you think it's a morally legitimate country as it exists currently? Does it have the will of its no, people, the popular no, I think that, I think that Korea should be a unified peninsula. But do you think that the current Korea South Korean you, government... No, you didn't. Here. No, you didn't. Because that could be true and you could have different answers. You could think that South Korea is a legitimate government and the peninsula should be unified. Or you could think the, the peninsula should be unified and it's an illegitimate government. It doesn't answer the question of do you think that the current South Korean government has more legitimacy by the popular sovereignty, the democratic processes that govern its workings? I think if the Korean people were given their true popular sovereignty... They would not choose to remain divided with the current government in power. Okay, I think so that if the that's the closest the real answer we're going to get. Just, just, listen, okay, so okay. Literally this idea, right? Fucking... This idea that if you allowed the people of the Korean Peninsula, North and South, to vote, that they would How vote they to decide? unify under <laughs> North Korean rule is insane. You know this is literally You are insane. You are you literally are fucking crazy. crazy. How could you say that? You are. You're just crazy. You're insane. This is insanity. Look, you have a doll behind you, and you're like 50 years old, bro. Okay, you have, you're in no <laughs> position to talk about this. This is the best you got, man. Come on. I thought we were actually having a really good point back and forth, but there oh, needs to be a separation of the nuance between whether or not. Let talk for 20 seconds, and he's like, all right, enough. 
And then fucking Lactoid <laughs> talks for like 20 minutes about chairs and goats and shit. Like, I think it's a, this is a fucking joke. This I don't think joke. listen, I'm not saying it's another explanation of the panel, but I think I know which of the seven little videos is he was more responsible than Dude, any you other. Talk like you got hit in the head with a fucking hammer, bro. I don't know what you're saying. Hammer, how does it feel, man? That must not be good. Okay. You've been, hey, we, you've been muted. Not right. smoker people. The capitalists have decided to mute you for five minutes. You're muted. Okay. Carry on, people. What were you? Valmet, the floor is yours. What do you want to talk wait, about? Wait, what? Can we please move on? I, 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 I've gotten, I really don't the, have a lot to say again, on this. Again, the floor not, is yours. The floor is yours. Uh, what would you uh, like to bring up? So I guess yeah. I guess to ask you directly, right? I guess to ask you directly. So we, we've, you've made a lot of statements, right, uh, in, in the time that you've had about how uh, there are social pressures, right? There are pressures that make the exchanges under capitalism null and void, non-consensual in a way, right? That the, the pressures to live, to eat, the uh, uh, pressures that uh, capitalism pushes on the workforce cr makes them make decisions they would otherwise not make. I guess what I would ask is how do you fix that? How, like, we, we, we can recognize that the communism of... Um, later years right the ideal communism isn't going to come about tomorrow what would be your first steps towards communism today that you would great make, please great question honestly uh thank you for <laughs> for that um yeah so currently uh the the position is there is a scarce labor market which creates which causes labor the value of labor to go up right and that's a problem for the capitalists because now that's interfering with their profits and now the fed is increasing uh, interest rates. I mean, I'm Canadian. That's a, that's what's happening here. It's making the cost of borrowing go up in order to cause uh, people's mortgages to go up. It causes our credit card debt to go up, which is forcing workers to take on like second and third jobs, which is creating a downward pressure on wages. Right. This is a this is one of the fundamental contradictions in capitalism. Now, my solution to this is through uh, organizing, fighting for reforms such as uh, rebuilding the trade unions. Um, electing a workers' government, right? Like not just, not just um, you know, like electing the Democrats is not going to get anyone anywhere. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but like an actual legitimate paradise. revolutionary workers' government, uh, elected by the people and accountable by the people. Um, do you think that's a realistic? Like we talked about realistic steps. Do you think that like there is will either in Canada or America to elect that kind of government? Like you talk think, about the that, Democrats think, not being the way, but at least in America, right? That's, I think there's I think there's a legitimately revolutionary energy brewing in America right now, okay. and I think I think there is a legit. Yeah thirst you know bernie sanders you know he's not again not a socialist but he was filling stadiums with with what he was saying right and the and they anointed hillary anyway like for that's just one example 26 million people marched for george floyd in 2020 right that's like that's almost 10 percent of the u.s adult population like that's that's not nothing right it was to the point where the president had to flee and like hide in a bunker for a day or two uh, the energy is there. And once this energy is channeled into something tangible, like, and, and the reason why this shit fizzles out constantly is because there is no revolutionary leadership. Um, once yeah. that is channeled and, and um, you know, can, and energized. Can you give me a, a name for a, a revolutionary leader that you would like to see? Like, it, you, you talked about voting in a re revolutionary government. Can you well, give yeah, me a that's name? Just one. That's, uh, but the working class taking political power is just... One is just one way rebuilding the trade union movements, right? So democratizing the workplace, so workers have value and input into how uh, how like the value that they produce is then channeled back to them. So re so rebuilding uh, economic power for the working class, I think th these two go hand in hand. This would go a long way towards what I would like to see. Um, uh, towards what uh, what I would like to see uh, 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 changed when the working class learns uh like when they actually start to win these sorts of victories in the process they are learning how to organize on a mass scale and a workers government could then nationalize the means of production i know that terrifies you guys but like uh, if we nationalize the means of production under democratic workers control uh then the then the working class learns how like how these industrial sectors work they were they learn how like the intricacies of the economy the uh the financial books should all be made public okay. the patent system needs to be abolished because the patent system is stifling innovation um and uh, uh only through eventually 
again, like this is just the start, right? This is no, this I understand. Is how we, well, that's how what we I asked the start, the, right? That's what I asked for the, like, the, the first steps. Mm -hmm. The transition towards a dictatorship of okay. the proletariat and then socialism down the road gotcha. uh, at some unspecified future. Uh, future, the working class, uh, you know, they're smart people. We will uh, figure one it question out. Question before before we move on, and I want to get the rest of everyone's opinion on on what he just said. And uh, your your mute's up in one minute, smoker. So uh, stay tuned, right? Um, I would ask, right? Um, what do you think of crown corporations in Canada? I'm sorry. Never even heard. Yeah, crown corporations That's are like corporations that are, that, are, that are owned by the state, right? And I'm not mm -hmm. talking. And so what we live under is a bourgeois democracy, right? We don't actually have a workers' democracy. So when I talk about nationalization, I'm not talking about nationalization by you know the current government as we would know it i'm talking about a general a genuine workers government uh so it would be so the government would be made up of you know your co-workers right who know who, like you know who knows the factory shop floor better than your co-workers i hate so you would elect co-workers to be honest I mean, with you fuck fair, those guys fair right like the uh, you know the, it, okay. it's a it's a it's a vicious vicious uh world we live in right now right but like if if you could elect uh one of your co-workers to a council of got other it. elected coworkers okay. from other industries. Yeah, we, got, you... we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get on to some other people, and I gotta let. Uh, so, so it's not smoker, okay? The reason I muted you is because there's a demand for a product, okay? And it creates a value for labor of me clicking that mute button. That's what happens, right? So, the people valued, right, uh, their ability to mute you at five subs, and so we negotiated a price, right? And that's what labor of value. I, I understand, right, that you have a hard time understanding this, but hopefully that you 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 can get it, and and uh, you know, we'll, we'll take you off mute now. So, go ahead. Can I... you're, you're, yeah, please, Lactoid, and then yeah, I, I want to quickly respond to the, to that. You know, capitalism, as I've expressed, um, really does allow you to engage in that what was just stated with more of like a workers cooperative style governance system. It allows you to engage in that um, in ways that the communism that's being advocated for simply doesn't, right? In a free market, if you wanted to form your own workers cooperative, you, you can. In fact, there's a fuck ton of companies that are workers co worker cooperatives. There's also a fuck ton of companies in which they're owned by their consumers, right? So credit unions, right? A lot of mutual insurance companies, right? A lot of them are owned by the people who buy those products. So yeah, I mean, you can have different kind of structures. I, no one has a problem with that. If you want to join one of these organizations or if you want to work for one of these organizations or if you want to start one of these organizations. Um, but again, the, the principal interest here that we have is consent. I want to like, you know, start a company and I want to run it this way. If I'm using my time and my labor and my material who is anybody else to come in and dictate to me how I have how I have to do that? In the same way, I'm not going to dictate to you. Okay. You want to have workers co work, workers co-op. Okay. I want to I want to get a smoker. He's been silent for a little bit, and I want to give him some space to respond to some of the things that are said. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I wasn't listening to a motherfucking thing in the panel. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, I actually did hear what uh you know Lactoid said at the end there though about. How, you know, well, capitalism is such a great system because you can just start your own commune. And like the idea is uh, the idea that you can develop a, you know, fully functioning economy that exists totally independent of the capitalist system uh, that it's b being built within. Uh, and then that will somehow represent some sort of like real socialism. And therefore, you have the freedom to live that out, you know, because you have the ability to make this supposedly in, uh, independent commune that's not dependent on, you know, the capitalist state it's built within. You know, it's it's such a fucking it's such a good example of how these people tend to think that everything they do and say happens in total isolation from everything else. And it's like, you know, it's just abstractions. It's not based in reality. It's, if anything, they're the real idealists here, which is so funny because everybody says that about socialists. So you... I, I am somewhat of an idealist, whatever. Um, I, I do think that the systems that keep on being referenced, um, at least by the communists, are other people making decisions with their own shit that they don't like. That's, that's 
almost always what it comes down to. I want to do this shit this way. Well, we don't want you to do this shit that way because it doesn't give us as much shit. I would, I would, I know Val, Valment has been trying to respond. He's been doing his hand, but you can't just do it like this weak kind of hand. Like I can't see it in the okay, corner. Sorry, you that's, alpha that's hand. what I'm used to. Okay, okay. All right. I'll just, I'll just interrupt. I'll just interrupt and tell everyone to suck my dick like the rest USSR. of you guys. Apparently, yeah, yeah, you got to have this mind, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm Canadian. I'm pulling the animal. Just kick in the door. Come on. Uh, yeah, so would you be surprised if I told you that I think, you know, I'm kind of in agreement with non-smoker that I think co-ops are, are bullshit. Like, you can't create little tiny yeah. microcosms of socialism within a, a massive structural worldwide system. So a socialist revolution inherently, by its own definition, needs to be on an international basis, right? And that's ultimately what was uh, the downfall of the USSR, uh, was that it cut itself off. It, it implemented Stalin socialism in one country. Uh, and then, it, and then it just sort of cut itself off and isolated from the rest of the world. And by by not, and, and that's because the international revolution after the end of World War One. That's because it failed, and so Russia was, in a sense, left isolated. And now, because you have scarcity within the country, you have the means of production that are under ownership of a unelected bureaucracy rather than an actual democratic workers' government. And that's why, um, you know, Marxists like myself will refer to the USSR often as a degenerated worker state, right? Not necessarily communist. I mean, th these are nuanced arguments that you I have between the USSR between other was socialists. Like, no, 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 communism. Nothing no. else. No, it, it just okay. Look, just because someone calls themselves uh, a communist and they're in charge of a country does not make that country communist. Right. Uh, you, you know, you can label A as B. It's not going to change it as A. Um, communism is stateless, classless, moneyless society. That's absolutely not what the Soviet Union was. Um, and uh, and it's by definition international. So it cannot be done isolated from like, like from the rest of the world. And uh, and that's why, like, uh, you know, as, as Marxists, when we call for revolution, we call for revolution, not just abroad uh, around the world we have to also focus on the belly of the imperialist beast right right here at home in in, in north america so uh, that's, the only, that's the only way international socialism can actually start to work so valnet so i i just want to give you a, an opportunity to maybe just rephrase um what you said initially which is that co-ops are bullshit just for anybody who's who's out there who thinks that having like worker control over the means of production is kind of cool um so like I uh, actually have a friend who started a co-op that she owns with other people and they make all the decisions about how to manage it. They share the profits of the, the people who work there and like own it and it's just them. There's no buddy above them. Um, is this is this like bad? Do you think no. that the CIA is coming in and like bombing like Just dance specifically, studios, specifically no, or, or, or wait, 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 wait. Or do you think that um, for for some kind of socialist system to work, it literally has to be a global authoritarian, like internationalist uh, shadow organization to have like a massive amount of power to prop up a system that doesn't work otherwise? Because that's right. that's how you came across. So I, I want to give you an opportunity to. To I, that. I, I, I appreciate that. Now, what I say when I say co-ops are bullshit, what I'm talking about is they're not a revolutionary thing. Uh, uh, I don't even consider them socialist just because you change the ownership of a specific store does not make it just like it doesn't it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the exploitation. You're just expo you, you just you just uh, you're just diversifying. You're you just you're just diversifying the exploitation in order for uh, workers in a co-op if they want to give themselves a pay raise then they're gonna have to build and sell more shit well how do they sell more shit they make more shit right and so that's gonna that's gonna increase so, which means that they have to work longer and longer hours to give themselves a pay raise wait wait wait, wait. that's uh, called and, being a worker wait, wait. can i just yes. That's why I'm just saying co-ops co are, are just microcosms in capitalism. They're just they're subject to the same laws of capitalism. They're not socialist. You think and I just get in here, so I don't. Is, that's kind exactly. Of like so so I don't. Um, I so apologize I for kind of stepping over your time, but I, I just want to present this because what you the end state of what you implied is that okay, imagine a world in which every workplace, every factory is a co-op owned by the workers. This is like a capitalist hellscape in which they're all being exploited, even if you control the means of production, they're still being exploited by someone somewhere, somehow, even if they're the owners, they're like, making the decisions, they're doing the work, they're deciding like, the level of production. 
wages will still exist and the value is still created. It's just that the value is then returned to the workers in, in other ways. Um, uh, so are these it, laws of physics then that, that you're kind of like working against? Like if you want to, yeah, if you want to make more money, you need to work harder. I mean, that's not exactly, more profound, stuff. that's not exactly a profound statement. Obviously I'm just saying co-ops are subject to the same rules of capitalism. They're not like, there's nothing inherently revolutionary about it. If you want to start a co-op by all means, hell, if you want to start a co-op under a socialism, uh, th there's nothing, there's literally nothing stopping you from doing that. I think it, really the question... depends, it really depends on what the majority of the working class decides, because remember, it's not communists taking over. It's the working class taking over. I think the question that Socrates is trying to tease out is what benefits are we not accessing via co-op that we would be accessing by a socialist revolution? Like, yeah. like, yeah, yes, definitionally it wouldn't be revolutionary, but like, what if we could get all the benefits without needing to go through the rigor mode? That, I think that's what you're because, trying to get at. Okay. Yeah. That's a fair question. And uh, it's because co-ops, because they're still subject to market forces, they're still subject to that sort of, um, that, that, that sort of competition, which creates downward pressure on wages. What we're trying to say is like, why not, instead of a co-op, it will have an individual factory. Why not have uh, workers elect, members and red delegates and representatives to coordinate with other factories rather than compete. And, and we do that on like an international scale. That's what I'm saying. So the, that's, so the that's, efficient... that's the difference, that, that's the difference between yeah. co-ops and socialism. Why, if I, if I'm the leader of the chair factory, why would I produce more chairs? Uh, that depends on, uh, you know, what if, uh, you know, there might be demand or something. So we're meeting demand, isn't that like yes. accepting market forces? Yes, there are seeds of socialism within capitalism. Capitalism is a necessary historical stage on uh, in the world. Capitalism is it lays the groundwork for socialism. Okay, okay, I, I'm just confused then for a minute. So you have no problem with like factories having to like meet market demand, and how are how are they going to be compelled to meet market demand? Uh, through planning, based on the data that they get back from sales. Walmart and Amazon are already examples, of, are perfectly good examples of planned economies. You scan sure. something at their register, that item goes directly to the manufacturer, and then the manufacturer produces those items and ensures that there is always stuff on the shelf. And what's the penalty and, and, for like not going through with this? What do you mean? So the factory decides not to make the chairs or the workers there, well, you know, it's not really a ton in for them to make the chairs. Why do they make, like, why, what if they miss their production target? What happens then? Why? Because uh, this was a major problem. There would be, there would be okay, yeah. Uh, there was massive problems in the USSR, don't yes. get me wrong. As in people were constantly missing production quotas and they were like fudging the numbers because they wanted yes. to make it look like they were you know actually why? hitting. Because you know they why? Could, because there wasn't any incentive to actually hit the production quota. Because there was no democratic input from the working class. It was just arbitrary quotas imposed imposed by an authority from the top down, rather, and they weren't responding to democratic input from the bottom up. Wait, wait, wait! No, I. You just said that the the way that like Amazon and Walmart are good examples of planned economies. They use data to track these things. They don't. They don't have democratic input on this. Or the quotas aren't yes. made by democratic input the quotas are made by the data the data yes. is what it, it sets the quotas so when lactoid asks you like why are they fudging their numbers why were they constantly missing the the quotas and you say it's because there wasn't democratic input can you square that circle for me yeah okay because they were using the ussr was increasingly reliant on old and outdated technology to increase their output and it was just physically impossible sooner or later the system would hit these impasses and and the whole thing okay, how down. does de democracy come into this though the workers would go to their workers councils and their unions being like hey we need new stuff right i have better ideas on how to run this factory more efficiently uh unfortunately under capitalism that's not that doesn't happen uh, 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 automation is also a huge thing that we would implement. Automation would be emancipatory under socialism, right? Automation under capitalism just forces workers out of work to compete for less and less jobs, which again creates a downward pressure on wages. Okay, gang. Uh, I know a couple people have to go. I want to give everyone here outros. We're not ending though. Don't go away, right? And you guys can stay if you want because there's a lot of people who've been wanting to jump in, right? Who've been begging me to jump in. And so we're going to open it up after everyone here gets their, their final say. And if you'd like to stay, you may. Um, but first, we're going to start with Flowtrace. Go ahead. Uh, give, give your final thoughts on where we can find you. What's up, guys? My name is Flowtrace. Twitch.tv slash Flowtrace. Twitter.com slash Flowtrace. I'm on Cricket Style J Show most every Wednesday. And I'm in and around the Twitch politics space. God bless neoliberalism for saving the world.
Uh, amen, brother. Uh, Lactoid, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to actually give a quick closing. This was part of my opening, um, but I, I think it fits here as well. Uh, for the people who are trying to decide what, what the answer to this fundamental question is, what is, you know, what is better, uh, communism or capitalism? I think the question is, the, the, the choice put in front of you is clear, right? What is better, an amalgamation of consensual decisions made between adults or hordes of economic incels that want to weaponize the state to extort resources from the people who consensually acquired them? Communist ideologues are genocidal hive minders that represent an, idea, that represent an ex existential threat against both humanity and the independence of man. I won't say they're all evil. I think some people here are not evil. Um, but they all universally subscribe to a evil ideology based on bodily violation, making them akin to slavers and mobsters. And hopefully we have purged their mind of this poison. I'm not too optimistic, but uh, for the people in the audience, I hope your minds were purged from the communist poison today. If you liked what I have to say, you can find me at Lactoid TV uh, on Twitch, YouTube, and Twitter. Thanks. Nice rebrand. I like it. People can now know where you are. I shouted you out in chat. Go check them out, gang. Uh, next up, Nonsmoker, please. Yeah, twitch.tv slash nonsmoker. Um, I don't know. I didn't really get anything out of the whole panel. I thought it was a big waste of time. But uh, thanks for having me on. Okay. Well, thanks for being here, I guess. Socrates, please. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Wick. Uh, I really did this to help increase your capitalisms, both in the short term and the longer term, because um, this is what it's about. It's about capitalist solidarity. It's about capitalists helping capitalists exploit themselves maximally. And um, thank God for uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, creating the gig economy that we all know and love today. Uh, if you want to work a little bit more, make a little bit more money, drive an Uber. It's, um, you know, uh, so it'll depreciate your car a little bit, but uh, it's worth the ride. Um, shout out to uh, China's capitalist rise. Shout out to uh, America and its unstoppable climb upwards to a brighter future. Okay. Thank America. You for being... Isn't she beautiful? Socrates, gang, check him out. Um, uh, where can people find you again? Uh, you can find me at um, twitch.tv slash Socrates. That's T-E-A-S-E. -E. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Real Socrates. Um, and I've got a YouTube, uh, Real Socrates as well. i got to start putting stuff up there. Okay, excellent. Thanks for being here. Uh, next up, uh, first time guest on my show, but hopefully not last time. I, I enjoyed the one-on-one the -on -one we had for a little bit. Uh, Valmet, please. Where can people uh, find you and what are your closing thoughts? Can I just tell, yeah, just a, a real quick short story there's a town in uh in florida called baldwin uh because it wasn't profitable to sell groceries there the last grocery store left and so the town actually bought the last remaining grocery store they filled it with produce from their local uh gardens and farms and uh, the workers kept their jobs they were paid a living wage and any profit that was made from the store was put back into the town via necessary utilities and services and there's no reason we couldn't do this on a, on a on an international scale if you are serious about learning how to build a better world than the system we have now uh in which um uh in, in which you know the the choice is work or starve if you're interested in building something better if you want to learn what you as an individual can do um in terms of either building a union at your workplace or uh one of the most powerful things you can do learn the theory learn the history learn the economics and learn the philosophy of marxism if you want to learn more about marxism feel me check me out twitch.tv slash l35 and i'm also can be found on twitter Yeah, it's Valmet. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I muted myself. Sorry, gang. Thank okay, you. Uh, was, last was, but certainly not fun. least, the person who is responsible for this panel, unfortunately, didn't get a lot of speaking time, but he's field of, hopefully in the opening, he can. Uh, Vigilante, please, where can people find you in closing thoughts? Go ahead. You can find me at twitch.tv slash thevigilante666. And you can also find me on Twitter at the vigilante 666 as well um this has definitely been a very interesting panel um uh, we had comments thrown out there like from lactoid the whole thing about uh people not being entitled to other people's labor when that's quite literally what the people at the top of corporations do is 
flaunt their money with the entitlement of other people's labor and barely do shit to earn it. I mean, there is so much, so much better that we could do in progress. And people need to remember that we are talking about a multi-step process. No country in modern history that has tried the socialist process, the communist process, has even gotten past the state capitalist phase. It's an unfortunate reality. We actually need to try what we are trying to do. And it, we really don't even know if it works in theory, but we suspect that it should because it's the natural process of how things go. 